Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this seminar today on uh, Brexit. Uh, we have with us Professor Matthew Goodwin, who is going to present on the question of why did Britain vote to leave the EU. We then have three commentators who are going to offer shortish reflections, five to ten minutes, on the th some of the themes raised by, uh, raised by Professor Goodwin. Uh, so, and so we'll hear from Sophia Hunger for, as a first commenter, who's a second year researcher in SPS, Professor Hans-Peter Creasy from the SPS department, and uh, James Dennison, who is a research fellow in the Migration Policy Centre. Uh, Professor Goodwin is uh, from the University of Kent in the UK and is very well known for his work on Britain, Europe, radicalism, immigration, Euroscepticism, has published extensively, including... Uh, uh, influential books on UKIP, and I've momentarily forgotten the title. It was uh, Revolt on the Right, how could I forget? Revolt on the Right, and of course the book uh, that you can see on the very first slide here, Brexit, Why Britain Voted to Leave the EU, written with Harold Clark and uh, Paul Whiteley. So Matt will speak for around 30 minutes or so. We'll have three comments to respond, and then we'll open it up for general discussion. So I'd like to welcome Matt and invite him to speak. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to make sure that everybody can hear me. Um, great. Uh, and it's great to be here. Uh, it's always a welcome change from um, the typical scene in UK higher education when you uh, come to uh, the EUI um, and the, uh, the lovely environment. Uh, so I've got 30 minutes to basically try and put forward my um, thesis on why Britain voted to leave the European Union. And the one thing that I'll say at the outset is that this effectively is really only one chapter in this book. Uh, this book deals with a lot of long-term change. It looks at the campaign. Um, and I, I, in my mind, at least, this book is actually a sequel to a book that I wrote with Robert Ford called Revolt on the Right, where we looked at the evolution of British society and the way in which the underlying foundations of politics have been changing and really laid the foundation for Brexit. So what I'm talking about today um, is really what motivated that vote for Brexit. And I'm sure in the discussion, because everybody has their own particular version of uh, the Brexit uh, issue, we can get into perhaps some of the, the other angles. So this is what David Butler and Hugh Kitzinger wrote in 1975 in one of their well, their book on the, the first referendum on whether Britain should stay in or leave the European community. British support for staying in the EC was wide but not deep. There was no girding of the loins for the great European adventure. And effectively what uh, I should say Sir David Butler and uh, Hugh Kitzinger were saying was that even though the British voted to uh, stay in what was then called the European Community, they did so largely for pragmatic reasons and they never really fell in love with the European project. And I know that those of you who are familiar with the European identity versus national identity issue, I know James and Andrew and others have looked at this, you will know in, that, in those classic Eurobarometer questions that the foundation for Brexit was really laid quite a long time ago given that the British have never had an effective uh, attachment to the idea uh, of the European uh, Union. And I say that because it's the background to what I'm about to present. So findings from a three-wave representative national survey that uh, we undertook with YouGov between the spring of 20, uh, between May 2016 and the immediate post-referendum uh, 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 environment. And what's nice about it is we have a panel design here, so we're able to look at the evolution of British public opinion and party choice during the key referendum period. We've got nice sample sizes, got a lot of different questions on a range of issues from immigration to uh, national sovereignty to EU membership. Gives us a lot of data to, to play around with. And if you just look at basic British approval uh, versus disapproval of EU membership over that period between 2004 and today, you can see the first point, and, and this is something we look at specifically, is that British public opinion on Europe has been notoriously volatile. Okay, it's been up and down. Uh, approval has, has, has been a clear majority. Uh, disapproval has been a clear majority. And if you'd held the referendum, by the way, in 2011, 2012, you can see that big peak 
in disapproval of EU membership uh, as the effects of the crisis were really being felt. Um, and as we had a very, uh, quite an unpopular coalition government with David Cameron and a more socially liberal brand of conservatism, you can see that actually leave would have been, I think, clearly the firm favorites. But as that referendum period neared, um, approval actually begins to increase, and this is what's influencing David Cameron and his strategists when they're thinking about when to hold the referendum, but then it tightens as voters begin to zoom in on that question of whether they should remain or leave. And during the immediate, uh, more, more sort of immediate campaign period, you can see again across the polls, the telephone polls and the internet polls, that there is a lot of volatility, but in general, as that, as that uh, polling day nears, the race begins uh, to narrow. Uh, and of course, during this period, we saw two very different visions uh, of uh, Europe put forward, the Remain camp principally focusing on a rational choice economic self-interest narrative, and the Leave camp principally focusing on a sociotropic immigration and identity uh, narrative. The results then come in, and you all know this story, so I don't need to spend too long on it. Suffice to say that Brexit really did cut directly across the traditional party lines. If you look at the Labour-held territory in the UK, an estimated 140 Labour-held constituencies voted in a majority for Brexit. Uh, so it really did cut across the labor base, especially in those northern economically disadvantaged former manufacturing heartlands. But in the conservative territory too, especially down the east coast of England, lots of coastal areas, uh, lots of left behind communities, um, the darker the shade, the, the higher the support for leaving the European Union. You can really see that the heartland for that leave vote is down that east coast and into the southwest. Scotland, the university town, and London are the notable outliers. Wales voted in a majority for Brexit. Scotland, of course, voted to uh, remain. But what's interesting is, is that what the, what the, um, the chart uh, looking at remain and leave by party ID doesn't quite convey is also the class difference within the Labour vote. Uh, so if you look at Labour support by working class C2 D&E voters, uh, support for Brexit was actually 45%. They were almost 50-50 split, whereas if you look at middle class Labour voters, there was a much uh, stronger uh, lean towards, uh, towards Remain. I always wonder who the 7% of UKIP voters are who say they voted to remain in the European Union, but uh, perhaps we can come back and discuss, uh, discuss that later on. So the interesting question then is why did this happen? And as I'm sure many of you will know, the nice thing about where we are in political science and the social sciences is we have a good deal of literature that gives us uh, some useful starting points. We've got studies of attitudes towards the European Union starting in the 1990s, a sizable literature on what shapes public opinion towards Europe and referendums, beginning with that classic study by Butler and Kitzinger, but also more recent contributions. And we've got this debate within the literature on uh, Euroscepticism between those that emphasize identity, so-called soft factors, the role of ethnic threat, for example, in driving negative attitudes to the EU, those that talk about utilitarian economic self-interest factors, thinking about Laura McLaren, Pierre Schiepers, Marcel Lubers, those sorts of scholars. Uh, a very vigorous debate around what's actually driving this. But of course, within Britain, we also have a specific literature, which I think now uh, deserves more attention, which is on the construction of British or specifically English national identity uh, over, the, over the last few hundred years. Uh, Linda Colley, uh, Robert Toombs, Michael Kenny, uh, many arguing that British national identity or, or more specifically Englishness has been constructed by defining itself against uh, the other from mainland Europe and that helps us, I think, to understand British public reactions to immigration, which if you go back, if some of you use a British election study, you will know that in 1964, when David Butler ran the first edition of that, uh, even though overall levels of migration to Britain were very low, David included an open-ended question on immigration and was astounded to see public uh, negativity uh, to that one question extending across multiple pages uh, of the responses and was at a loss. To, under, to, to really explain why the British were so animated about that particular issue. And I think that's where 
the literature on Englishness and, and Britishness can, can help us uh, uh, move forward. We've also got work on risk aversion. Larry Leduc, for example, who's, who's written on referendums and the way in which as we get closer to polling day, voters tend to uh, revert back to the uh, status quo. And of course, in Britain, this was David Cameron's big gamble. He thought this would be just like the AV referendum in 2011. He thought it would be just like the Scottish independence referendum in 2014. He really invested in the idea that the British might express disapproval of EU membership, but they would ultimately revert back to the status quo as voting day uh, neared. Another strand of literature looking at the role of heuristics or elite cues and leaders in nudging people towards particular outcomes and a growing pile of research on emotional reactions. But what we really use as an anchor here is this nice uh, paper by uh, Huger and Marx, 2005. Some of you might be familiar with it, Calculation, Community and Cues. And effectively what they argue is that public opinion towards questions like remain versus leave and questions as to whether pe we should stay in the European Union are driven by the importance of cost-benefit calculations, feelings of attachment to a wider community, and cues or heuristics from party leaders and elites in society. And we're using that as a basic framework for, for exploring the Brexit vote. And in a way, the, the, the focus on that, that notion of community and identity really, you know, you, you, we can expect it to be especially important in the UK given that historic relationship with immigration, but in particular given those rising levels of net migration that, that began particularly from 2004 after uh, Tony Blair and New Labour did not impose transitional controls on EU nationals who were going into the UK when other European states did. And I think one of my personal um, uh, views of Brexit is that uh, you know, Tony Blair, and, and first through that particular moment in British political history when British voters were told by official sources that only 30,000 EU nationals would arrive, and in the end, net migration went to over 300,000 per annum. Only Germany between 2009 and 2012 had higher levels of net migration. But, but secondly, that was followed crucially by David Cameron's undeliverable promise that he would reduce net migration from the hundreds of thousands to the tens of thousands. So in their own way, I think that Tony Blair and David Cameron are the unintended architects of the Brexit vote by really fueling public concern over that issue and unfortunately misleading uh, the British public uh, on what they were capable of, of uh, achieving on that issue. So just to stand back, how were British voters thinking about the European Union before they cast their vote? And I'm looking principally here at costs and benefits and what they felt were the costs and benefits of leaving the European Union before the referendum itself. And I think it's worthwhile just quickly running through these just to take our mind back to that moment because much of the Brexit debate today, I think, continually fails to acknowledge how the Brits were thinking about this issue. Um, how did they expect it would uh, affect their personal finances? A plurality said, no difference, uh, won't really affect my personal finances. But 30% felt actually that their personal finances would be worse off. But crucially on immigration, over half of our overall sample, this is both Remainers and Leavers, the overall sample, felt that by leaving the European Union there would be less immigration into Britain. And I'll come back to that point. On terrorism, 21% felt that Britain would be less at risk of terrorism, 63% uh, said no difference, 16% said Britain would be more at risk. On foreign affairs, would Britain have more or less influence in the world if we left the European Union? 64% said this won't really make much difference. You know, these debates we're having now about global Britain, at that point in time, you know, the British were fairly divided on that. 21% said we'd have less influence, 15% said more. But on the national economy, and I think this is quite important, 39% said they expected the British economy to be worse off. 37% 37 37 said no difference. Only 24% expected the economy to be better off. And some of you might have seen the opinion poll over the last, uh, about two months ago, by YouGov, which showed that 60% of Leave voters would accept economic damage if it meant they got Brexit. And almost half of Leave voters would accept a relative losing their job if it meant they got Brexit, okay? So I, I view that as somewhat in line with, with those more recent polls. Turning to what people felt would be the perceived costs and benefits of remaining in the European Union uh, before the vote, um, 
the EU has kept peace in Europe, 37% agree, 34% say neither, don't know, 29% disagree. Uh, staying in the EU would mean more terrorism, 47% overall agreed, 28% uh, disagree. Uh, being in the EU uh, would give us workers that we, we need, again, quite conflicted, 41% agree, 32% disagree. Remaining in the European Union would erode national sovereignty. You can, see, you can see that, I don't need to talk it through, but over half saying remaining in the European Union would. Uh, remaining in would benefit British culture, 40% disagree, 31% uh, agree. So we're beginning to get uh, a picture of an electorate that was already quite clear in how it felt Brexit would change the country, that it would lower immigration, would in broadly speaking make the country less at risk of terrorism, would protect national sovereignty, um, and uh, would, uh, would overall, uh, I think, put a, put a sort of fence around that notion of, of British national identity. And we then use um, factor analysis to summarize the, uh, those costs and benefits, which reveals that two factors in particular are a useful representation of these data, that those who felt that Britain's economy uh, uh, would thrive after Brexit, that Britain would have more global influence in the world, that those views were highly correlated, uh, and those that felt that Britain would be better able to control migration, that we would be less at risk of terrorism, uh, also loaded uh, onto a distinct factor. And I'm going to use those two in our modeling uh, in a second. It's also important to remember that as leavers were getting ready to vote for Brexit, the vast majority, almost three in four of those that ended up voting for Brexit, felt that um, they wanted to lower immigration into the, into the country. Uh, only 14% said they wanted to keep immigration at the same level, only 5% wanted to increase. The overwhelming consensus among those Brexiteers and what they're expecting today are fairly sharp reductions in the overall level of migration. But because we want to tap the role of emotions too, we asked voters, how do you feel about the European Union before the referendum? And the dominant emotion uh, among uh, voters uh, was uneasy. Uh, they felt uneasy. 23% angry, 26% hopeful, 19% afraid. But if you aggregate up those emotions, about half of our sample felt negatively about the European Union before the referendum. Only 32%, one in three, uh, adhering to positive uh, emotions about the European Union. And of course, we can debate until the cows come home. Is this all because of British media and is this all because of misinformation? But it, it just prior, a few days prior to that vote, negative emotions uh, were far more uh, visible uh, than positive. And we also asked voters in terms of tapping those perceptions of risk, do you feel that leaving the European Union would be risky on a zero to 10 scale? The, um, the mean here was 5.6, revealing that most voters were kind of open to this idea that Brexit was indeed going to be uh, risky. And of course, this is a strategy that the Remain camp really double down on that they frame this as Brexit being a risk rather than the European Union being a positive contributor in its own right. And that, I think, is a strategic decision we may want to come back uh, and discuss. So just having gone through costs and benefits, risks, emotions, and just kind of talking through some of these arguments that I'm going to, going to uh, look at in more detail, Let's just turn to who actually voted for Brexit. And I know that, you know, you, I don't need to spend too long on this slide. You're aware of the socio-demographics. But it's a pretty familiar picture um, uh, in terms of where the debate is that Brexit, in terms of individual level voters, was mainly, not exclusively, certainly, but mainly driven by voters who tended to be middle-aged and elderly, um, who were more often than not white, uh, more often than not identified as English. Um, it's important to remember, however, that one in three black and ethnic minority voters uh, voted for Brexit. So if you look at cities like Birmingham, for example, that was a surprise for me on the night that Birmingham voted in a majority to leave the European Union, very ethnically diverse and so on. No real gender, no real gender gap. Big educational divide, as you'd expect. Um, if you look at university graduates versus non-graduates, a very sharp divide, and across social grades, um, support for leaving being strongest among those C2 skilled workers 
and semi-skilled uh, and those on benefits. Uh, Middle-class professionals much less likely to back Brexit as you'd expect, but still significant that one in three uh, did so, right? And one of my personal grievances with the Brexit debate is if you take away those uh, un atypical groups that voted for Brexit, graduates, uh, ethnic minorities, some parts of the middle classes, some Londoners, for example, then actually Brexit probably wouldn't have happened uh, at all, um, but still worth reflecting on. Um, so we then, uh, let me report the results of our bin binomial logit model where we're looking at uh, the referendum vote being uh, leave and then we're looking at the relative effects of these different uh, arguments uh, and theories on that actual leave vote. Um, and I'll make sure Aurelie can uh, share the slides so you guys can sort of look at them at your own uh, leisure. So the first thing to say is that the strongest effects come from those benefit cost calculations, that if Brit British voters felt that the national economy would thrive after Brexit, that Britain would have more influence in the world, that Britain would be better able to control immigration into the country and would be less at risk of terrorism, those two factor scores really have the strongest effects on vote to, uh, the vote to leave. Conversely, if you felt that Brexit was going to be risky, that was a big gamble by the Remain camp, you were significantly less likely to vote to leave. And if you felt positively about the European Union, emotionally, you were significantly um, less likely to leave, which raises the interesting question that I'll leave hanging in the air, which is, how would this referendum have gone had the Remain camp spent more time making the positive case for EU membership than making the negative case uh, for Brexit? Uh, no real strong uh, effects regarding the political parties, but on party leadership effects, what I think is significant is that both Nigel Farage and Boris Johnson uh, appear to have significant effects on voting to leave. Now, why is that interesting? Mainly because you know, they come from two very different traditions in the Eurosceptic family. Nigel Farage spent much of the preceding three years talking to working class Labour Eurosceptics, Boris Johnson speaks far more clearly to middle-class conservative Eurosceptics. But if you liked Nigel Farage, if you liked Boris Johnson, you were significantly more likely to go on and vote to leave the European Union. On national identity, the only effect here is that if you identified as Scottish, you were much uh, less likely to, to vote to leave, as you, as you would expect. But the story here is very much one of uh, benefit cost calculations uh, and leadership cues uh, really uh, playing uh, quite a strong role. If you then look at the impact of those significant predictors on the probability of voting to leave, you can begin to see just how strong uh, those uh, attitudes towards uh, the economy and influence and immigration and security really work together to deliver the vote for Brexit. If you felt that the British economy would be okay, if you felt that Britain would have more influence in the world, if you felt that immigration would be reduced and that Britain would be less at risk of terrorism, and let's not forget that the referendum was taking place against the backdrop of the refugee crisis, against the backdrop of the British tabloid media constantly uh, linking to stories of refugees and terrorism and so on. Then, as you go from the minimum to the maximum, you can see the effects that that has on uh, increasing somebody's probability that they'd be a Leave voter. If you felt that Brexit would be risky, if you positively identified with the European Union, if you were a Conservative Party identifier, to a lesser extent, you were, you were more likely to, uh, you, sorry, you were less likely to, likely to back Leave. I think the Conservative Party is an interesting factor in this discussion because we forget now, but at the time, the Conservative Party was visibly divided over Brexit, that there was a strong Eurosceptic element, but actually David Cameron and much of the cabinet and most of the MPs ended up back, uh, campaigning to, to remain. Uh, Farage and Johnson, that awkward alliance uh, of two Eurosceptics uh, working in tandem on different parts of the country, I think even though they widely uh, loathed one another, they were uh, a significant factor, uh, that, that partnership in, in nudging uh, leave over the line and Scottish identity coming out uh, as you would expect. Just to, just to kind of take a slight detour for one second to kind of bring in a little bit of qualitative research, well, qual an open-ended question that I, that I like, 
which I really think hammers home some of the messages that I'm trying to uh, convey from our modeling. The British election study had a very nice question where they asked voters in their own words to explain why they had voted remain or leave. And then Chris Prosser and John Mellon put those responses into a word cloud. And you've got an overall sample here of about 15,000 respondents. So this was the leave cloud. And you can see the way in which immigration, sovereignty, control, and country and borders really came to the fore. There's a crucial point here in that the BES team are very clear in stating that even when voters said sovereignty, they often said sovereignty in a way that related to borders and immigration. So sovereignty was often not seen in the Daniel Hannan sense, the kind of libertarian free market sense, but was actually seen as being principally an issue around borders. Just in case you're interested, uh, the Remainer uh, cloud uh, looks quite different. Uh, economy, rights, trade, human security. And of course, as some of, my, uh, some of my discussants, I'm sure, will point out that what we're picking up on here are elements of the underlying value divide that's been rumbling through Britain as much as it's been rumbling through other West uh, European democracies. So if we look at these different models, and I'll sort of this is a, a shameless plug to kind of have a look at the chapter in more detail in the book. If you look at models that only take into account socio-demographics, national identity, party identification, they really don't have much explanatory power. It's when you begin to consider the complex interplay of how people felt about the EU in terms of their emotions, the cues that they were getting from leaders, the perceived risks of Brexit, and those all important calculations of whether they felt leaving would be a benefit to the country or would be a risk that you really begin to get some serious explanatory power. So we're engaged in a public debate in Britain where we're trying to reduce Brexit to that one factor, to that one explanation. And what we're trying to say here is it's slightly misleading. And as we all know, it's a bit of a ridiculous endeavor. But there is a complex interplay of emotions, leader, uh, cues, uh, risks, and benefits, and costs in driving this decision. The interesting question then becomes, well, what was shaping those perceptions of benefits and costs? What was actually affecting whether people felt that Britain's economy would thrive, or Britain would have more or less influence in the world, or whether Britain would be able to control immigration, or whether Britain would be more or less at risk of terrorism. And this is where I like to think of us going into the back room of people's minds and looking at the factors that were affecting their decision-making process as they're going into the ballot box, as they're really beginning to not just think about the direct effects on their vote, but what are those indirect effects? And we included here attitudes towards immigration and also whether people felt that the European Union was now taking control of the uh, UK economy as a, as a sort of proxy for, for sovereignty. And one of the interesting findings, for me at least, is that if people felt really anxious over immigration, if they were negative and they said there's just too much immigration, it's having a negative effect on the country, um, they were much less likely to see uh, um, Britain as, as being uh, losing economic influence, as losing uh, uh, economic power. Uh, they were much more likely to be revved up by those beliefs that Britain would be able to control immigration, that Britain would be less at risk of, of uh, uh, terrorism. And so in, in the back room of people's minds, the legacy of immigration policy in the UK and the legacy of what has been unprecedented demographic change in the UK, often not related to people's objective experience, just what they've seen through television and media and so forth, we can begin to see how those attitudes to migration were affecting how people were coming at those costs and benefits when they were making that decision. Um, in terms of party leader images, again, if people felt positively about David Cameron and uh, Jeremy Corbyn, they were much less likely to see the benefits of Brexit, but if they identified with Farage and Johnson, uh, they were much more likely to see the perceived benefits of Brexit, to feel that they'd get control over those all-important uh, issues. Um, and in terms of so socio-demographics, no real surprises, university graduates, middle-class professionals much less likely to see any of the benefits of leaving the European Union. Although interestingly, and I'm sure we'll pick up on this in discussion, since the referendum, the Remain camp has broken in two. Uh, effectively, 25% have said we should continue to work to overturn Brexit. The other 25% have said 
okay, I don't like Brexit, but we should continue to work with it because overturning it would be something of a uh, sort of a, a you know a catastrophe for the public uh, consensus and the social contract. Um, and also looking at uh, what was shaping the perceived risks of leaving, and I think this is quite um, quite important too that again, in the back room of people's minds, how they felt about immigration, how they felt about, in their, in their eyes, the EU controlling the national economy, made them much less likely to see Brexit as a risk. And our entire public debate at the moment is focused on the, the Brexit deal being damaging for the country and being economically risky. And I'm sure many of us would probably agree with that analysis. Um, but that, take, that ignores the fact that for many Leave voters, who, who already felt economically left behind. This wasn't a risk as far as they were concerned. They'd lost out long before the collapse of the Lehman Brothers and the financial crisis. So for them, rolling the dice you know, was an avenue to uh, a, an outcome that might be better than what they were facing at that particular time. But those migration uh, concerns too were rumbling away in the background. And just to kind of put that graphically, how people were feeling about that perceived risk of Brexit, if they felt left behind economically, if they felt anxious about immigration, if they were anxious about the extent of control from the European Union, if they identified with Farage and Johnson, then they were significantly less likely to view leaving the European Union as a risk. And of course, the implication of this, given where Britain is going, um, um, becoming a more unequal society, if you read the Social Mobility Commission report two days ago, um, levels of migration will remain significantly higher than most leavers anticipate, even if overall net migration has fallen uh, since the referendum. This is unlikely to change in any meaningful sense, given how uh, unequal uh, the British economy currently is and how much it leans towards London and the southeast. And just lastly, as I'm just five minutes over, I think that one of the interesting questions that perhaps we'll never really know the answer to, but we put forward one idea, which is given how close the referendum really was, right, and you had remain focusing on economic risks, and yes, they were partly right to do that, but our analysis suggests perhaps they should have made more of the pro-EU emotions, and they couldn't really afford to completely neglect that issue of immigration. What was it that actually nudged leave over the line? And I just wanted to hammer home maybe one factor that I do think was quite important, which was Boris Johnson surprisingly coming out for Brexit in the final days of, uh, of, of the, um, uh, well, a few days before the campaign um, began. And I say that because actually, when we look at the effects of liking Boris Johnson, he does have a significant effect in driving people towards uh, voting uh, to leave the European Union. If you felt positive about Boris Johnson, who is not a toxic figure in, well, he, I think he is perhaps more today than he was in 2016, but he at that time was not a toxic figure like uh, Nigel Farage. I think he was able to introduce to the Leave camp something that the uh, Eurosceptics certainly didn't have in 1975. In 1975, the only people campaigning to leave the single market were Hillary Benn um, and Enoch Powell, sorry, Tony Benn and uh, Enoch Powell, uh, quite maverick, uh, strident uh, figures. Um, but uh, in 2016, you know, there were legitimate political heavyweights that were campaigning uh, to leave the European Union. And one, one of the interesting factors, of course, is the way in which those two campaigners in different ways spoke to different audiences. Um, if you look at, if, and we, we just distinguish voters uh, and their views towards Boris Johnson and Farage by class, um, what's interesting is that you know, Farage is less popular than Boris Johnson across the spectrum, but among working and lower class voters, he's slightly more popular or significantly more popular than he was among middle and upper class voters, uh, Boris Johnson being more popular across the board. But maybe, you know, and I just put this out as a suggestion, the divided campaign for Leave was actually one of its strengths, that because of its divisions, it was able to speak simultaneously to Labour voters in northern industrial heartlands and quite affluent conservative areas in southern England and the cities and, and to some extent, the university towns. 
So where are we now? Um, the headline point is nobody is changing their mind. If you ask British voters, do you think that Britain was right or wrong to vote to leave the European Union? Um, the green line is wrong and the blue line is uh, uh, right. You can begin to see, in recent, this includes the most recent polling data, so in recent weeks, uh, the percentage saying wrong has basically risen slightly to 46%. The percentage saying right has, has gone to 42%. Now, the margin of error is three points. So in effect, there's been very little meaningful change in public perceptions of whether this decision was right or wrong. And you'll know that if we then look by leave versus remain, they're incredibly polarized as they are by generation. So there really isn't much in the way of change. And um, just lastly, you know, what would happen if we had another referendum? Um, one of the things that we, we do in the conclusion is um, combine the official result with evidence on the preferences of those who didn't vote at the referendum when we go back and say, well, how would you have voted? And that indicates that in, if everybody who had voted had voted, if everybody, sorry, if everybody, uh, if everybody who didn't vote had voted, um, then Remain would have had an estimated 50.35% vote share. But of course, if you include survey uncertainty um, and the 95% confidence interval for the Remain vote running from 486 to 52, then obviously that can go either way. So if we then run a simulation of a million referendums and what would happen uh, over those referendums, then it looks a little bit like that. Uh, so Remain, the odds of a Remain victory around 1.94 to 1, meaning that Remain would probably win um, uh, you know, roughly two, two in two, two out, two out of, um, yeah, would roughly win just slightly more than half of the time. Now, of course, to Remainers, this is a, this is the uh, the the real reason why they need to galvanise as many people uh, as absolutely uh, as possible, because of course, millennial students, among others, didn't really mobilise to the extent that they told pollsters they would have done a problem that Hillary Clinton will be very familiar with. And so perhaps uh, if indeed there is another referendum, then uh, uh, Remain may be able to balance the scales. But unfortunately, I don't feel that there will be another referendum anytime soon. So thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. So just uh, just say as well, if anybody wants the slides, if they send an email to migration at eui.eu, so it's a migration at eui, we will send you the slides, if that's okay with you, Matt. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. So we've now got three uh, commentators before we open up for more general discussion. So we begin with uh, Sophia Hunger. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Matthew, for your very interesting talks. Um, I have several remarks, and um, some of them are directly um, linked to the presentation, and some are more generally targeted uh, to your book. Um, the first bigger point is, is the difference between UK and the rest of Europe. So um, you show in one of your last chapters that the attitudes, the drivers from Euroscepticism are quite similar for both um, 18 European countries and the UK, so the attitudes towards immigrants and the perceptions of uh, relative deprivation seem to be common drivers. And what you do show is that the, the attitudes towards immigration are quite similar um, between the UK and the other countries with uh, two outliers that are um, less skeptic about, uh, skeptical towards immigrants, which is Sweden and Germany. But for the others, it's, it's quite similar. And um, I would also have been interested to see um, the distribution of this variable when it comes to relative deprivation, because the coefficients are quite similar, but it's hard to really get a grasp of them if we don't know how many people there are actually there with those attitudes. Um, another very interesting point comparing the drivers of Euroscepticism uh, across Europe is that in continental Europe, uh, satisfaction with democracy um, decreases Euroscepticism while it increases Euroscepticism in the UK. And this leads me to my first bigger point, which would be um, if there is like a general difference not only in the extent of Euroscepticism, but also in the quality of Euroscepticism. 
And I would propose a hypothesis and uh, would like to hear your thoughts on that. Um, because in your book you show that UKIP, UKIP have, has campaigned of Euroscepticism for several years and it started as a single issue party as we all know. And um, I would like to argue that the prevailing type of Euroscepticism in the UK is, is a complete rejection of, rejection of the European project. What a European and a UK Euroscepticism might share is like an anti-elitism, but the consequences of this anti-elitism might be, or I think they are quite different, because in UK you will completely reject the European project, whereas I think, um, especially for Western European populists, they would not reject the European Union as a whole. They reject Brussels, they reject the bureaucrats, but they don't, they still work together with other radical right um, parties and they they strengthen the idea of like an ethnic ethnic ethno pluralist mm. Europe. Um, they want to restore national cultures, but they also want to work together in order to protect the big European project, which for them would be the preservation of the Judeo Christian heritage against to build a fortress against the invasion of non European immigrants. And um, I would be very interested uh, mm. to hear your thoughts on that. Um, my next point is somewhat related to, to this ethno pluralist notion. Um, so in many European uh, pop or many European uh, populist radical right parties work together with the identitarian movement that mm. has gained a lot of supporters in the last couple of years. And especially the Front National, also the FPÖ in Austria, and um, also the AfD, even though they are not quite open about it, they try to hide it. They have official statutes in their, or if, if, uh, official regulation in their party statutes that kind of is aimed to prevent that, but it still happens. So I would see this as a sign of like the different identity politics. You, you emphasize like the campaigning on Englishness. And I would see this maybe as an evidence that the Euroscepticism is quite different. Um, but, however, I just saw today, researching for, for your talk, that the first official meeting of the Identitarian Movement in London just happened in October 2017. So I would like to know if you think that now, after Brexit, the times of campaigning on the Englishness is, is maybe over. Mm. Um, then as a third point, I, um, I have the impression that the UK, UKIP is less successful when it comes to younger voters um, as compared to other radical right parties in Western Europe. I mean, in the last elections, most people turned out for, for Labour, and the media even spoke of a youth quake. And this is quite different to, to France and Germany and Austria, where the shares of voters for the radical right parties are either relatively similar across age groups or where they're even higher for younger voters as we see it in France. And as you suggest in your book that there is, uh, after Brexit, there's still potential for populist politics in the UK, with or without keep, UKIP, I guess rather without. Um, I think that uh, the populist forces would have to uh, campaign or like mobilize younger voters in order to be successful. And um, I would like to know what your stance is on that. I would like to know how they can turn this around, how they, how populist forces in, in the UK would be able to mobilize on, on younger voters. And my last point is more on research design, and it's also more a question than a remark. Um, I found the, the survey of the more than 12,000 UKIP members very interesting, and I think it, it has had a lot of detail and provided uh, rare insights. And as I'm a researcher working on populist radical right parties, I know that it's quite hard to get in contact with, uh, with these parties or even to get information from them when you want them. And um, as some radical right parties do not even allow journalists to be present at their party conventions anymore. So I would be interested, and I think um, a couple of other people in the audience might too, um, to know how, what your advice would be on approaching radical right parties. You make mm. this remark, I mean, you in your acknowledgement, you mentioned that you, the collaboration with them was quite good, but I would like to know if you have any advice on that. And that's all from my side. I thank you again Very for your helpful. presentation, thank you. and I look forward to the discussion.
Thank you. And I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll let Matthew respond to the comments. We'll take everybody one at, a, one at a time, have a response from Matthew, then open up for general questions. So, Hans Peter. So, I, I have four points, which are luckily quite different from Sophia's points. My first point uh, refers to uh, what you showed in the beginning the approval of. EU membership in, the, in Britain varies considerably over time. And this reminded me, I mean, I, I speak before James, but uh, James showed a similar graph uh, last year when he talked about Brexit. But his story was a different one. His story, and I appreciated it at the time very much, so I don't know whether you will say it again, but uh, there was a lot of Euroscepticism in Britain already for a long time. Mm. And uh, I mean, you show a variance, but uh, the zero point is not there. The variance is between about a third and half. Mm. So if you compare Britain to other countries, it's the most Eurosceptic country in Europe. Mm. So it was from all, the beginning, as I mm. learned from James, quite hazardous to, to call this referendum. You insist on the variation. I would say uh, uh, the level uh, is mm. interesting as well. My second point is uh, addressing the, the, the triad, trias, which you uh, also in the book uh, take as an orienting kind of structure, principle, calculation, community, and cues. It comes yeah. from Hoche and Marx. Yeah. And uh, I, I like the way you uh, stress that uh, the pro campaign was all about calculation. It was mm. all about the, the economy, and the uh, leave campaign was all about community. It was all about, uh, uh, it was a narrative, uh, a nationalist identitarian narrative. So far, so good. As soon as I have, you have presented your own ideas, which were referring to Linda Colley and the British identity, and. Uh, so stress the identity, you immediately talk about cost-benefit calculations. And the book, I, I cite from the book, at its root, the UK's debate about its EU membership turns on whether being a member of the club has delivered objectives on which there is widespread agreement, like economic prosperity, security for citizens, value for money in public spending, and more generally, if the EU is responsive and accountable to the electorate. So it's all about cost benefits. At its root, the book says in another chapter, uh, my third point is really addressing what you show us in the binomial logic model. Now, why did they do it, you ask? And that is why did the majority of the British vote against EU membership? And two factors are most important. It's the cost-benefit economic influence factor and the immigration terrorism factor. So it's these factors of uh, cost-benefit calculation in both cases. If you think that Britain is doing economically better outside of the EU, and if you think that Britain can co control its security and immigration better outside of the EU, then you vote for Brexit. Also, if you think it is not risky for the British to leave the EU, and if you have negative emotions with regard to the EU, you vote to leave. But why did some people think Britain would do economically better outside of the EU? Or why did they think that it would not run a risk in leaving the EU? You, you showed us, you tried to answer this uh, question, but in your presentation, you did not <clears throat> underline what I would underline in answering this question. Mm -hmm. Because what you see in your regression is that at least part of the answer is cues, partisanship and leadership images. And if you uh, look at this regression, you, I mean, we cannot see it, it's too small. But if you look at these regressions, you see it's not just Nigel Farage and Boris Johnson, it's also David Cameron and Corbyn, who have a significant effect. Mm. 
Now, to elaborate on this, can you show the, the graph with the green pillars? Yeah, it's, yeah this one. Now, in interpreting this, you did not stress the point I would stress. Mm. These are single factor models, and then at the end, the composite, uh, the composite model. The composite model explains 90% of the variance. It's gigantic, and I would say it's too much. And I explained to you uh, what I think. But first, look at the, the individual models. The first one is uh, called... Um, Sociodemographics. No, no, they, they, let's just forget about the left right. three, the, 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 the relevant ones. Mm. They deal with uh, the cost benefit, mm. explains 80, this factor alone explains 85%. Risks perception explains 73%. Leadership images explains 71%. And emotions explains 71%. So each one of the factors explains at least three quarters of the variance. What does that mean? That means these factors are highly correlated. They are part of a syndrome. They are part of the emotions, leadership images, cost-benefit calculations, identities. They all go together. If you are on the one side, you have positive emotions, you uh, don't think it's risky, uh, and so forth. Now, what does that leave us? Where does that leave us? And what have we learned? I mean, all these regressions sound like an exercise in tautology. If you think Britain benefits from leaving the EU, you vote for leaving the EU. If you think it is not risky, you uh, vote for leaving the EU. If you favor Boris Johnson, you also think Britain will win when leaving the EU. But you might favor Boris Johnson because he tells you what you have thought all along, namely that it is beneficial to leave the EU. So we really don't know exactly what the drivers of Brexit are. We just know it's a syndrome, but identities, community, and cost-benefit calculations are closely associated. We cannot separate them. If we take for granted for a moment, and I tend to do so, that cost-benefit calculations were indeed very important in the British case, you might think this is typically British. Already Margaret Jet Thatcher asked for a rebate. Yeah, and, and what did David Cameron do? He asked for better, a, a better deal. Mm -hmm. So the British elites queued the people all the time in terms of cost benefits. Now, this is striking. If you take a book like Diaz Medrano, uh, who uh, compares the Spanish, the Germans, and the British with respect to their attitudes toward the European Union, you read that in Germany, uh, uh, it was very much about World War II and the Germans trying to show the Europeans their peaceful intentions. So they had a totally different not calculating a kind of attitude with respect to Europe. And the Spanish, for the Spanish, it was a return to civilization, a return to modernity after a decennies of living under Franco's authoritarianism. So, I mean, I, I think you are really on target if you talk about British identity, which is a highly calculating identity, uh, which is why these things go so uh, strongly together. Now, my last point really re refers to cues. Mm. And I, I think it is no accident that you find stronger effects when you try to move a little bit yeah. away yeah. for the cues. Mm. People uh, are cued by their elites, and they have been cued for many, many years. Uh, and in the campaign, you had, of course, the conservative split. Yeah. But you also had a lukewarm Labour Party who was not really doing what it should have done. And you, uh, I, today, I read uh, in Sandbu's uh, column, which I always uh, like to read, <laughs> I read there was the Blair-Brown decision not to join the Eurozone. 
and and uh, what uh, Sandbu speculatively <laughs> tells us that this marginalized Britain within the EU, it was no longer in the center. And uh, as a result of that fateful decision, uh, Brexit was foreshadowed because these cost-benefit calculations for the British turned more negative uh, as a result of this decision. Mm. So this is it. Mm. Uh, thanks, Matt, for a really fascinating talk. And I think the talk, like the book, the two of the big strengths were just how comprehensive it is in terms of data at the individual level. And if you were following the campaign, if, you, if you're in the UK or if, if you've been following British politics and you read this and you see these tables, there are just so many stories here and it's so interesting. And I think a few of them which I noticed this time, which I thought were especially interesting, were some of the things that didn't matter. We talked about cues just now. But in the first logit model you showed us, liking Cameron didn't matter, liking Corbyn didn't matter. And in the funnel of causality, we should expect these highly proximal indicators to be really important, and they're not even significant. This shows you how fundamental uh, Euroscepticism in the UK is, and all attitudes to the, to the EU are in the UK. Another thing which didn't matter in the UK, in, in that model you showed us, was European identity, and this is one of my big points about, about that's used to the EU. The reason it didn't matter in this model is because, not because there's no effect, but because it's not statistically significant because the sample size is so small, because just so few people identify as European that, it, that it's not significant. And then another thing, uh, if I can remember, is that leave contact it was not significant either. And the reason for that is that uh, attitudes there was such strong priors on the EU by this point that um, that contact really didn't make that much difference. Now, as I say, I think the strengths were that it's extremely comprehensive and there's so much data there. And some of the weaknesses, at least in this section, as you say, you take a more aggregate historic approach in other parts of the book. But in this section, while, uh, while the information is, is extremely broad, it's not that deep as an explanation for Brexit for some of the reasons that Hans-Peter said. But I'm not sure Hans-Peter is exactly right on some of them. So while I think that, uh, yes, it's true that we do need, to, if we want to say Brexit happened because of this, we have to compare Britain to other countries. Because the key to all of this, the key to uh, analyzing Brexit is understanding that the drivers of Brexit is a subtly but fundamentally different question to the drivers of voting for Brexit. This presentation was about the drivers of voting for Brexit, an individual ex level explanation. Why individual A voted to leave, why individual B voted to remain. But what were the causes of Brexit requires understanding things about the UK and comparing them to other European countries. Now, Hans-Peter says, oh, one of the differences between the UK and other European countries is the elite. For example, the decisions to not join the Euro. For example, party queues. For example, Blair and Brown. But this is still not deep enough because Britain couldn't join the Euro. The reason it couldn't join the Euro is because uh, it, it was most proximally because the voters wouldn't have allowed them to. And a little bit less proximately, because the UK had joined the ERM, it tried to join mon the monetary system, and it simply couldn't. The, the speculators robbed the EU of billions, of, uh, robbed the UK of billions overnight when it tried to. The reason that they could do that was because the UK it lacks monetary synchrony with Europe, with Germany in particular, and with the eurozone. So it simply couldn't join a single European monetary system because it's not uh, European enough economically. Its trading partners are far less European. Its uh, investment flows are far less European. So to say that if, if the party leaders had done X, Y, and Z, Britain would be a good European and not an awkward partner is too shallow of an argument because they tried. They tried for 40 years and they failed. And they, even no matter what they had done, they would have still failed because it just is simply not integrated enough to make it work. And so that's why Britain didn't join. Euro, and that's, you're right, that did make it an awkward partner and outside the club. But there were many other similar examples of Schengen, of I could go on and on, of all the opt-outs. They simply couldn't do it. So I think that uh, the idea of party queues as an explanation for Brexit is, is quite weak, in, at the individual level, at the aggregate level. And I think that your book, Matt, does a, a great job of showing that as well, which is that if you do a dynamic factor analysis, if you control for house and mode effects in the campaign, uh, Leave had the lead the whole time, during the whole six months. The campaigning made no difference. 
Cameron made no difference, Corbyn made no difference because Britain had been so uh, divided on Europe for so long. Everyone had priors. There was nothing anyone could do really by that point. And it became down to a 50-50 toy toss, uh, coin toss, I should say. So um, essentially, I think my main comment is that the book is clearly an excellent resource. And I think, as I say, it says many, many stories. This section is good at explaining why some individuals voted for leave. It doesn't explain, it simply can't explain because it has the wrong unit of analysis, i.e. the individual rather than the country, why the UK left now, why it was the UK that left and why it left now. And then the other thing which I would like Hans Peter, maybe Sophia's comment, uh, comment on as well, is we talk about Britain as an awkward partner, as anomalous. And that's true in the EU, but how does this literature and how do these findings, how do they relate to all the other European countries which never even joined? So how, how, does, how do the predictors of Brexit, um, are they similar to the predictors of voting in, I don't know, Switzerland, Norway? I think if we start to see it from that kind of angle, we can see that we can get a, a much deeper insight. Uh, but thank you very much for an excellent talk. And as I say, there's just so much here to talk about. As uh, James said, there's so much here to talk about. I'll, I'll uh, give Matt the floor to make a, a response to the comments that have been made, and then we'll have time then for a general discussion as well. Quite a lot of comments there. Yeah, thank you. Um, that might be the best feedback I've ever received. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, thumbs up to EUI. Um, a lot better than uh, some of the conferences I go to. Um, okay, so just in order of questions, and I'll keep them brief because I'm sure we want to open up discussion as well. Yeah, uh, I liked your point, Sophia, about the quality of Euroscepticism, hard versus soft, and I sort of took from your the way that you're asking the question that, you know, the tradition of hard Euroscepticism has always been more entrenched in the UK than it has on mainland Europe. And I think, you know, I, I, certainly, I certainly agree with that. But I think the, the, what the hard skeptics did, which historians may come back and talk about, is hard Euroskeptics in the, in the 90s after Maastricht, if you'd looked at hard Euroscepticism in the UK, you would have looked at what was a very f quite a fringe constitutional issue that most voters didn't care about. If you go back and look at the Ipsos Mori issues tracker in Britain, only about 8 or 9% of the electorate said Europe is an important issue for me in the 90s. It just wasn't on the radar. But the hard Eurosceptics in the early 2000s did something that was significant, which is that they merged that hard Eurosceptic tradition with immigration as an issue, and that opened up the electorate uh, for anti-EU campaigns. It, it, it opened up that factor of kind of ethnic identity threat that we've talked about in the literature on Euroscepticism for 10 years, but which really became center. And if you, if you look at, say, Jeff Evans's piece on the difference between 1975 and 2016, he shows quite convincingly the, the, the way in which migration really was the key difference in people's assessments of Europe as an issue. In 75, it, it was there, but, and, and there was certainly latent public um, concern over that issue. But the salience by 2016 had really, had really increased. And I think why we pick up on this as being a very important indirect and direct effect is because of that concerted strategy. And most of the senior Eurosceptics will admit that, that they wanted to really widen that out. 70% of Leave voters, if you look at John Mellon's work, for example, either had voted for the UK Independence Party or said they would consider voting for the UK Independence Party, that the the role of that episode in British politics between 2004 and 2014 was very important in actually galvanizing, especially non-voters, white working class voters, into the political process. Um, and I think Englishness is, you know, with a, with, a, with a study like this where we're looking at the immediate referendum campaign, or certainly what I would consider to be the immediate by, you know, the 10 years basically leading up to it, 
you know, what I'm not saying for a second is that national identity formation and national identity concerns are not further back in that funnel of causality back over the decades. And that's for a political historian or for another book to look at. But Englishness, I think, is certainly, certainly something that runs through that. And you asked a very interesting question, Sophia. Is Englishness over? And I always think back to the 2015 general election campaign where we watched David Cameron run up and down the country trying to whip up the English against the Scottish National Party, saying, well, you must vote Conservative in order to stop Scottish identity influencing um, effectively English politics. And so seen from that perspective, you know, David Cameron, again, was partly the architect of his own demise by mobilizing Englishness. And we know that people who identify as English were significantly more likely to um, uh, associate with, um, with, with wanting to lower immigration over the years. Um, in that respect, David Cameron pursued a strategy that, in effect, did uh, also contribute to the foundation for the, uh, the Brexit vote. Um, many of the areas that UKIP had cultivated went on to vote for Brexit, and I suspect had UKIP not been in British politics, then Brexit would most likely not have happened. Um, but we can debate that. The, the point about age profile, I think, is another interesting one. Um, the radical right electoral movement in Britain has always been different over the last 10 years from Le Pen and Haider. It's always had a slightly older demographic. But I think that is largely a product of party framing and messaging. I can think about groups like the English Defence League, the Football Lads Alliance, which at the moment is very active and sort of 10,000 people going to its demonstrations. Um, young, working class, um, low educated, um, clearly different profile from the UK Independence Party electorate. An intergenerational conflict now is very much at the heart of British politics. And the, the underlying divisions that we're alluding to in this conversation were really entrenched by the outcome of the general election in June, where we saw 64% of millennials back Jeremy Corbyn. And for the first time, you know, um, well, certainly in the history of the British election study, I think I'm right in saying that was the strongest ever level of support among that age group for the Labour Party. But it also underlines the way in which the potential for populist mobilisation, and you made this point, Sophia, I think is still very evident to anybody in British politics. It's evident on more than one flank. First is that even if you buy this argument that immigration was a very profound influence on the Leave vote, well, Leave voters are not going to get what they want, which are dramatic reductions in immigration. Yes, net migration may fall, but it will never fall to a level that will satisfy the average Leave voter because they want migration to go back to effectively where it was in the late 1990s, which was well below 100,000. And because of past migration patterns and because of the fact that Britain will probably have a liberal migration policy maybe in exchange for access to certain areas of the single market or certainly a favourable trade agreement, Leave voters will never be satisfied on that core identity issue. So there's plank one for populism. Plank two is economic grievances. And, you know, the irony in, in British politics, in a way, is we're talking about the possibility of a new anti-Brexit centrist party. Could a Macron work in Britain? That's the wrong question to ask, I think. The, the right question to ask is, could a new political party work in Britain? Absolutely, but that party looks very different from En Marche, a party that is both pro-Brexit and anti-immigration, but also economically redistributive, that is anti-inequality, that is pro-public services, that is more protectionist. And the reason I say that is because if you look at the Wait, the party alignments in June, where the Conservative Party had one of its best elections among the working class pretty much over the last quarter century and among non-graduates. And the Labour Party certainly had one of its better recent elections among middle class professionals and university graduates. And we begin to see Britain lining up in a way that um, obviously you've debated in, in other European states then you begin to understand why the potential is there for a party that simultaneously campaigns on identity grievances and economic grievances. 
Part of the reason the UK Independence Party was not more successful was because it was free market and it was pro-privatisation and it was led by Thatcherite uh, activists, which allowed the Labour Party to prevent the radical right from being more successful in traditional Labour constituencies. But we can debate that uh, at another time. And your last point, Sophia, on UKIP membership and advice. Um, the, this particular membership survey, which we're still working on, came off the back of a, about two and a half years of interviewing radical right activists in Britain, which were used for Revolt on the Right and another book. And that was, that is, I mean, it took about three years to build a level of trust and rapport where they were willing to allow us to do the membership survey on certain conditions that it wouldn't be released until after certain elections and it would only be released in academic publications. So it wouldn't be released in public domains and so forth. Well, I mean, you know, it would be used for academic research, not for other reasons. And that obviously has a lot of, I mean, it, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a different, it's a difficult place to be as an academic because it puts you in difficult situations. And the radical right literature historically, in my personal view, has not done very well at getting inside the black box of radical right parties. It's much easier to download the latest ESS and look at who's voting for them than it is to look at organization and leadership and activism. But of course, with David Art and um, Bert Klandermans and Nonna Meyer over the last 10 years, that's begun to change. I think that's very, very important. But um, it takes a long time to build up the trust and to build up the rapport, and not everybody will um, not everybody will necessarily be supportive of you doing that. But uh, I think it's very important, and I'll send you some papers on it. Um, on your uh, and the second discussant, and I'm with through because I want other people to, as well to have a chance to ask questions. Um, yes, I accept that. Um, if you'd looked on the point about volatility versus level, if you'd looked at that last Eurobarometer survey before the referendum, you would have walked away with nothing other than the conclusion that Britain was going to vote for Brexit. If you looked at all the questions on positive, negative feelings of the EU, um, attitudes of EU membership, uh, attitudes to EU identity, um, a whole host of things, basically it was... Britain consistently being the most negative, perhaps with the exception of Greece and a couple, and I think Cyprus on another question. So the level, yeah, absolutely. And the Eurosceptic tradition in Britain, I think, has been very well documented. You know, George and uh, Menon and, uh, you know, I, 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 I think that in general, we know where that Eurosceptic tradition has come from. We know it's there. We know it's entrenched. So I suppose from my personal perspective, I didn't, I didn't feel as though I needed to spend too much time on explaining the potency of that and where it came from, um, which is why we were looking more at that, that sort of 10-year period that was leading up to, to that vote. And the calculation community cues point, I mean, I think in effect, you know, what we're saying is that there was a, I mean, it was, there was a complex interplay between some voters looking at costs and benefits, some being quite strongly influenced by their feelings of identity and their effective attachments to the national community, and voters being nudged by, I think it's fair to say, two Eurosceptic politicians that come from two different parts of the Eurosceptic tradition, but who personally appeared to embody what it meant not only to be Eurosceptic, but I think probably also for some voters, effectively what it meant to be British or to be English. And while they, you know, party cues, partisan ID did not have the effects that you may have expected, I think in the backroom calculation of people's minds, that was an important legitimacy point that this wasn't, this went from being a campaign that historically was one of sort of being led by toxic, quite marginal, quite socially alienating figures to being one that was actually underlined by a stamp of legitimacy, that it was now coming partly from the mainstream and was not actually any longer a fringe uh, exercise, a fringe, uh, a fringe choice. 
Um, the reason we said at its root, and this is where I suspect we'll disagree and we can continue the discussion, but um, I view immigration as a valence issue in Britain. So when I say at its root it was about costs and benefits and valence politics, I view that. I view migration as a valence issue because 75% of Brits say they want to reduce immigration. Like this is not a conflicted issue in Britain in the way that it is in other European states. Maybe we should have shown that more clearly. But the, the you know, there is a unanimous support, more or less, for curbing migration, uh, for lowering levels of immigration. So when we talked about valence politics and the EU being seen principally through a, through a lens of valence, can it deliver economic prosperity for all? Can it be seen to be responsive? Can it deliver security? Can it help Britain to control immigration, which you know more than seven out of 10 voters want to see reduced? I think the assessments of Europe in Britain were perhaps slightly different from those in other European states, but I take the point that we would need to show that and perhaps spend a little bit more time uh, doing that. Um, I don't, I mean, I can understand where you're coming from on the tautology point, but I, I genuinely don't, I genuinely look at this book slightly differently perhaps than, than what you do and I, I than how you do. And I, I, I suspect that we'll never agree on this, but the, the point about disentangling direct and indirect effects, I think is to try and get at effectively two questions. One is looking at what is that direct influence on the vote, but secondly, what are those factors that are shaping the backroom calculations that people are making as they're thinking about these broader issues to do with Europe and to do with migration and to do with costs and benefits. And I don't think it's, I don't think of this as us saying, well, you know, going around in a sort of circular motion that doesn't necessarily explain why people ended up doing what they were doing. I think the I think the uh, I think the influences are quite clear, and I think they come out quite strongly. Um, but we're saying, perhaps, being too subtle, but you know, maybe you know, I can I'll certainly relay the comments to Harold and Paul. But that in in the back room of people's minds, they're also being influenced by how they feel towards their politicians, who they're looking for in terms of those points of influence, um, and making those assessments on that basis. Uh, on the cues, the issue, the point that you made, which I have a lot of sympathy for, is the fact that this was not a normal election because the cues that people would ordinarily have received were so mixed. The Conservative Party was completely divided, and I would go further than you, um, Hans Peter, in saying it wasn't that the Labour Party was lukewarm, it was that the Labour Party were not even on the pitch. Um, at the time of the referendum, something we mentioned in the book is that 60% of British voters did not even know where Labour stood on the Remain Leave question. Now, that's remarkable, right, given that that's the party of Tony Blair who wanted to take us into the Euro. What's even more remarkable is after 18 months, two weeks ago, 60% of British voters said they don't know where the Labour Party stands on Brexit. There's been a complete and utter uh, failure or vacuum of political leadership in that the one party that was supposedly making the case unambiguously for Remain, perhaps with the exception of the Liberal Democrats and the SNP, um, was not actually making that case forcefully enough. And of course, had they read your work on values and uh, the cleavage in Europe, they would have known that actually uh, working class, less well-educated, labour-leaning voters were primed to vote for Brexit and most likely would have rebelled against their party ID had Labour make, made more of an effort to actually keep those voters on board, like Jeremy Corbyn did in June, where he said to those voters, I will respect Brexit and I will reform free movement, which allowed him to keep together the northern industrial seats with middle class uh, professional seats. So he took Kensington, but he held on to Doncaster and he was able to hold that coalition because he gave the green light on the identity axis um, at the same time. I don't, I agree with James on joining the Euro, but I think the, the, um, the issue about people being queued for many years, absolutely. They were also queued for many years. And this is for somebody else to look at a great PhD thesis, maybe they were queued for many years on the identity axis as well, not only by politicians, but by large sections of the British media. We had, you know, going back to 
um, Margaret Thatcher in 1978 and going back to Enoch Powell, we've had lots of mainstream politicians willing to cue the electorate around immigration. We've had large sections of the British press willing to cue the uh, electorate on the issue as well. And so I think the what would be nice would be to see a longer term analysis of the role of uh, elite cues in actually uh, changing uh, or the influence on people's behavior. One of the arguments, at least, that we make, which taps into James's point, is that a lot of the Brexit vote, when you step back and you look at the evolution of attitudes from 2004, a lot of this was baked in. Like, you know, the, the cake was baked many years ago uh, in relation to, to the core fundamentals of this vote. Okay, but that's not to say that that was enough for Brexit to win. So people were instinctively Eurosceptic, and the point that James has made. The Eurosceptic tradition was strong. Anxiety over immigration is, is a national characteristic, uh, almost in Britain. But that's not to say that those fundamentals would always have been enough to cross the line. And when you're dealing with a 52-48 scenario, you know, we always have to kind of think what would be the, what are the factors that might have nudged people over that line. And um, I do think while cues were not sort of dominant in the campaign and the campaign contact was not, was not as dominant as perhaps people might have expected, I think the fact that you had an awkward alliance of hard Eurosceptics and soft Eurosceptics, you know, really, uh, you know, really is something we cannot ignore and may well have been enough to nudge, to nudge people over the line. The highest percentage of, of Brits that uh, identified with the European identity, from my memory, in the British Social Attitude Survey, or it might be the Eurobarometer Survey, was 17%. Never more than one in five Brits felt an effective attachment to a European uh, identity. And so, you know, was this the open question, and we'll never really know, was, was this ever going to go another way? Was this ever going to be a decisive Remain uh, win? Um, and it may be that more comparative work there, um, you know, is, is where we can begin to get the nuance of British Euroscepticism. We can begin to perhaps get the nuance of um, the role of cues and, and um, you know, the way in which perhaps politicians and parties in different European countries may well have made uh, may well have made the difference but I think you know the more and more I kind of go back and read now in a whole different place on British identity and Englishness and the long-term evolution of these trends you know this is more a personal point than an academic one I'm more and more of the view that you know in a way once the British were given that moment it was really only ever going to move uh, very strongly uh, in this direction. And the, the challenge was for Remain somehow to try and disentangle that, that tradition and somehow to try and engage with that concern over identity and migration. And of course, by completely ignoring it, much like the way Clinton really ignored many of the issues within, um, within similar districts in the US, you know, the message, I think, to those voters was that uh, once again, the mainstream is not willing to actually have a conversation with them on those issues. And just as an aside, it's worth noting that turnout was strongest not only in working class districts, but in districts that historically had higher levels of apathy in the past. So once you took voters out of a general election context and put them in a referendum context and put this issue of identity and migration at the foreground, then turnout surged as perhaps these voters felt that this was their moment to get that agenda, to get their issues, to get their values um, back onto the agenda. Thank you, Matt. So we'll now open it up to the floor for uh, questions. Uh, maybe take a couple at a time if people want to put their hand up and also introduce yourself as well. It'd be great. I've got two over here. We'll start here. Tim. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Tim Oliver. Um, just very quickly, based on um, that last issue that you picked up on there um, about the future of UKIP, how is any party like UKIP going to make a breakthrough in future, given that we're going to lose the proportional representation system for the European Parliament after 2019? How is that breakthrough going to happen, given the Liberals, the SDP alliance, and so forth, 
they face that massive obstacle of the first-past-the-post system for the House of Commons. So is the electoral system going to constrain any populism in future, or do you think it's going to bubble up through the Conservatives and the Labour Party? Take a second question, Matthew. Thank you, Matt Loveless, Jean Monnet Fellow. Um, I thank you, uh, Press Goodwin, for your talk. I just a, a kind of a quick question. We're supposed to ask a question and then say something smart afterwards. I don't have anything smart to say afterwards, but I, I think I agree with the panelists. I think the, the responses were right. I'm not sure this is an EU support question. I don't know if that's the framework to best think about this question. Let's think about the the, the, the sale of leave. It was. Um, to claw back our money from the EU. It was to return immigration levels to the previous levels. It was to restore national pride. I mean, these, this is you know, reversion politics. This is appealing to a group of people who, who, who feel like society has gotten away from them, that it has accelerated out of their reach, and they, they would prefer it, quote unquote, the way that it was. That's not really an EU question. It doesn't fit in the standard model. We don't have that question in the standard model for EU support, per se. We don't have people saying, I would like to, I'd like to get out of the EU because I liked being out of the EU, which was the reversion question. But if we think about the appeals in the UK, where else have we heard this? Um, you, we're going to bring the jobs back. Uh, we're going to build a wall. We're going to make America great again. These are exactly the same. These are exactly the same three planks that have worked on this, and the same appeals in the US. Uh, seemed, they seem to overlap. You have this reversion. Reversion politics, the people saying, no, I want it back the way that it was. It's accelerated away from who I am. So maybe this is a, maybe the Brexit question is uniquely different from an EU support question and is something else altogether. And I was trying to think in Europe if there was any example in Europe outside of e support for the EU in which reversion politics has played an important role. And the only one I could really think of was nostalgia, which was the, 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 the kind of non, the, 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 the East Europeans who, would, who continued to support communist parties after the wall had come down, for example. They, they said, no, I know that it's not better for me. I know that society is moving forward, but I still liked it better the way that it was. Maybe this has some um, analog to kind of the, the, the emotions, this back backroom uh, activity that maybe uh, that you referred to several times. Thank you. Okay, uh, and a third question. Um, my name is Julia Schulte-Klos. I'm an SPS researcher. And in your talk, you said like most likely there wouldn't have been a referendum without the existence of UKIP, right, or without a successful UKIP. So I would like to push this further and let, w would like to ask you, without a conflicting um, institutional formula in the EP elections, would you could be so successful? So it's only since 1995 that um, all member states have to use the PR formula. So without the PR formula in EP elections, would you could have become so successful in the first place? Could I just ask, ask a very, very short question as well? After all you've spoken about today, why on earth did David Cameron decide to do this? <laughs> yeah, some really excellent questions. Um, the uh, the issue, um, of the, well, the last the last question and the first question sort of go together on on the UK Independence Party. Um, I've done some stuff in some other papers with Oliver Heath, looking at the relationship between UKIP support and Leave. I mean, I so my kind of view on this is that. Um, in fact, I was reading a book recently. Uh, Jens Ridgren um, has a great book, 2012-2013, Class Politics and the Radical Right, which is kind of compulsory reading on my, um, my third year module. But it has, I think, Hans-Peter, Hans you make the point that lots of the voters that are instinctively receptive to populist parties are often not participating in politics. Right, that they're often quite apathetic. They're not necessarily voting all the time. And I think, you know, in a way, the rise of the populist right more generally, but we certainly saw this with the UK Independence Party. Lots of the people that came back into politics and started voting for UKIP after 2004 and 2010 were often, not always, but often voters who had stopped voting after Tony Blair and New Labour came to power in 1997, right, that had lost uh, lost any sense that the mainstream establishment was representing their concerns and in fact felt instinctively hostile to what was the so-called new liberal consensus on pro-EU membership and also immigration. And UKIP I think was significant, you know, you see a very strong association between 2014 levels of support for that party and the Leave vote. It was significant because it basically ran around the country cultivating a lot of those areas that would then go on to vote for uh, leaving the European Union, and in particular, lots of areas that historically had voted for the Labour Party. 
I think today, to answer Tim's question, it's very difficult to see where that particular movement goes, largely because it's got everything it ever wanted, right? I mean, it got the referendum, it then got the vote for Brexit, and it will probably, you know, given the events of today, which I'm sure has been going on while we've been in here, but I imagine that there will be a deal of some description that will include, you know, a sort of two-year transition and etc. Unless I'm horribly wrong and the whole thing's crash this afternoon and we're heading into a hard Brexit, in which case UKIP's really got everything uh, it ever wanted because it certainly doesn't support a transition. But that also is where you see the seeds of possible political turmoil in Britain in the, in, in the future. You know, there are lots of people in the Conservative Party who say their losses among middle class voters and more liberal voters at the recent election um, need to be fixed and that the Conservatives need to go back into the university towns and London and begin to connect with millennials and younger voters and Generation X voters. There are going to be lots of Leave voters who will feel betrayed by the vision of Brexit, who will feel angry about the lack of reduction on immigration, who will continue to feel as though the economic settlement doesn't work for them. And they will look at Jeremy Corbyn, I suspect, and we know this from quite a lot of survey work this year, they will say that's not somebody who's patriotic, that's not somebody who fits my identity. So they'll agree with Corbyn on the economics, but they won't agree with Corbyn on identity, on the need for migration controls and so on. So most work, I mean, a lot, quite a lot of working class voters in Britain, that's why I say, they sort of want a political party that doesn't currently exist because they're conflicted. They're conflicted between the economic preferences and they're conflicted between their cultural uh, concerns on uh, migration and the EU and Brexit and, and so forth. So Theresa May has sort of spoken directly to them on the identity axis and Corbyn on the economic, but that's still very much in play and it's going to be interesting to see where that lies. And Matt's point about relative deprivation I really like because one of my frustrations, at least with the public debate in Britain, not so much with the academic debate, is, you know, we sort of fall into this, is it economics, is it culture, right? And we don't really, um, academics do a much better job of looking at the relationship between, between those two. And obviously education is one bridge, um, but I think some of the work by Justin Guest and Peter Hall uh, at Harvard on subjective loss and the role of subjective loss in influencing people's attitudes towards uh, not just immigration, but the political system, uh, whether they feel as though they have a voice in that, and as something that possibly may bridge objective economic experience with how they're acting politically, uh, sociotropic concerns about the position of the wider group. Um, the New Minority is quite an interesting book in that respect, looking at voters in Barking and Dagenham, which went on to vote for Leave by, I think it was 65%, 70%, and voters in Ohio who ended up leaving the main, well, leaving the Democrats, I think, to vote for Trump. And just in making that point that nostalgic deprivation, a belief that things were better in the past than the present and that the present will probably be better than the future, I think looking at the role of subjective loss and relative deprivation, obviously, is not a new argument, right? I mean, it's 50, 50 years, 60 years in the making, but it's an interesting area where maybe there could be more work looking at the interplay between economics economics and culture and, and values. Um, and just lastly, um, on, the, on the question of uh, would there, why did David Cameron do it and would there have been a referendum without the radical right? David Cameron did it because he was a gambler. Um, he'd won the 2010, well, he'd got his party back into power uh, he'd won the AV referendum, he'd won the Scottish independence referendum, he'd won a majority in 2015. It's amazing what office can do. Uh, I'm sure as Tony Blair would testify. Um, but he believed genuinely that, you know, he was going to win this and that by calling it quickly uh, and by standing behind it very firmly, that he'd be able to uh, deliver that uh, further victory. But of course, instead, will now go down in history as... Uh, the third post-war prime minister who will forever be remembered for one thing. After Anthony Eden and Suez and Tony Blair in Iraq, David Cameron will forever be remembered for Brexit and perhaps laying the foundation for the dissolution of the UK. <laughs> I mean, depending how far it goes, but 
ultimately Cameron's legacy will be one tainted with, by Brexit because he underestimated. There are two things. One is Hans Peter's point, which is not only the euro disconnected Britain, but leaving the EPP disconnected the Conservative Party from the mood in the EU. When the Conservatives withdrew from their pan-European alliances, they just didn't really understand what the mood was in Europe. And then when Cameron went for the renegotiation, was shocked to discover he couldn't get everything that he had hoped for. But the second issue was the internal pressure of Euroscepticism within the Conservatives from backbench MPs, but also from without in terms of UKIP. You have to remember that 2010 to 15 was an incredibly perilous moment for the Conservative Party. They were having to share power with the Liberal, Liberal Democrats. You know, they, they were you know, having to, uh, as they saw it, fight for a majority, having to try and compete, uh, you know, aware of the fact that they were now, uh, you know, the natural party of government, as they like to call themselves, was having to share power. And the UK Independence Party was winning significant levels of support, not in fringe territory, but in core conservative home county shires. And that was alarming for many MPs and found its expression through internal pressure on Cameron. So without UKIP, there would not have been a referendum, but without the European Parliament elections, there would not have been the UK Independence Party. Do we have any more questions? Yes, over here. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, Guillaume Vidal. Um, so I wanted to pick up on one of these last comments that you made about the divide between the economic and the culture uh, debate. Because on the one hand, you have mentioned that it's the working class, it's those left behind. And at the same time, you have focused a lot on emotions and culture. And I was wondering where, where is the economics behind that? No? In the sense that, uh, could it be that these cultural values uh, have an economic side behind them? And have you looked at that? Have you seen how uh, income, for example, make labor market vulnerability predicts the vote? Just uh, as a general question. And then I was wondering, how do you measure social class? Because in the logic models, it seems to be just a <coughs> continuous variable. I couldn't see the, the categories. Is it self-reported class? Is it based on the labor market? What scheme do you use? Uh, Laura Seelkopf. Um, I wanted to go back to the wider question on, you know, for, for social scientists on, on perceptions and, and reality, because what I, and you know, and then I guess we can all go back to see whether we have a deal or not on, on the specific Brexit, but you know, what I have, when you said in your talk that this is all about cost benefit, I, I strongly disagree. Or, you know, you, and it, it seemed a bit because I think it's very much about very subjective and as we probably all agree with wrong cost benefit analysis by a certain, um, you know, by the Leave voters, mostly probably. And, and that reminded me very much of, of your, you know, uh, of something that, that Polymetrics did so, um, in the US after the Trump election where they showed voters the picture of um, people that came to the inauguration by Trump mm -hmm. and, and another picture and they let them estimate very more people and that was very clear and, and you know similar to I think how it should be very clear to all of us now and all the voters what the economic consequences of Brexit will be. So um, and, then, and then there was this significant number of people that voted for Trump and I think 25% or so that said, even though it was very clearly that there were fewer voters on, on his picture, that this is where more people were. And, and I think this is very much what we would see here. So when people that, you know, if they would just look at the numbers without, you know, all the context and all the culture awareness would probably have a different cost benefit analysis for the economics. And I think that's also the post-rationalization that we see going on that by now, because they voted for it and they are so much into that, this is why nobody wants to change their opinion based on facts. And this is also why people now suddenly say, you know, before when we voted, we thought, you know, it might be good economically. And now they're suddenly willing to, you know, take their father or their son or their daughter, you know, job losses just so they can Brexit. But, you know, I think it's not in line with what you show, but it's the very opposite, actually, because they wouldn't have guessed that before the referendum. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I just want to know, actually, if there's something similar to the Trump thing that you could do or that you have done. That's mm. actually the question. Mm. Mm. Do you want to ask? Or, or do you ask us at the end to come back? 
What is it? Is it a question you have? No, no I don't. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll come back at the end. Okay, do we have any, any more questions? Uh, Kiki, I work as an administrative assistant with the MPC. Um, so I was working for a British politician in the European Parliament for years before the referendum. So the level of Euroscepticism never really um, obviously surprised me, especially because he was working on immigration. But for me, I always thought before the referendum, I always thought that Remain would win because, because of the sort of surge of fear-mongering on the economy, you know, that the, that the Conservative Party especially, especially usually do. Like, I thought the trend would follow the Scottish referendum, you know, when you saw at the end that when it came down to jobs and the economy, I felt like that was probably the final push that that um, that stopped independence. So from just from what your presentation was today, is it a case that maybe that last sort of ditch attempt to sort of make people more afraid about their jobs, did that not work? Because at the end of the day, a lot of the Leave supporters actually didn't really... Um, I mean, prioritize the economy, as you said, that they, some of them, you know, they, they thought already that they were in a sort of negative position, so this wouldn't change it. Do you think that had a big influence? And also as well for Campbell, why, or for Cameron, why did he take the gamble on, on, on um, having a referendum in the first place? Was that also because he thought that the same strategy would work on the economy, that it would make people in the end switch to remain, that it, that sort of similar strategy would take place? Um, and then, Finally, I wanted to ask you what you thought about the, I suppose, the responsibility of the left on the final vote. I mean, people always say, oh, once, once Cameron rang the bell for a referendum, then that was game over. But I don't, I don't believe that. I feel like it was more of a failure on the left. I mean, you look at the charismatic figures that came up. You've got Boris Johnson and Farage. You hate them or you love them. You can't deny that they're charismatic. You know, they appeal to a large section of the, um, of the voters. Similarly, you know, to Trump, I think a lot of sort of people who are against, maybe not against politics, but they can't reflect or attach or connect with the politics right now, and that's a huge number of people. I felt like maybe if the left had some sort of, you know, charismatic leader or Corbyn had even come out and been in any way passionate, not even passionate, clear about what he actually wanted, a bit of clarification in the minimum, I felt like that would actually have probably helped a lot. I'm just wondering, do you think that the left has a lot to a lot to, I don't know, answer for or could have had a bigger sway in the final decision than what actually took place. Yep. Yeah, great. Uh, another round of great questions. Um, I don't know how I'm going to write this email to my co-authors because it is going to be an essay of uh, points and questions. So, um, the uh, yeah, so the culture values economic question. Um, if, you, if you look at a book that we did, Revolt on the Right, where we charted... Uh, people's attitudes and values around Europe, uh, immigration, the political system, um, looking at how those uh, interact and relate with their economic position. So there's a long kind of 50-year story there about specifically British politics. But I think it's fair to say that maps on quite nicely with some of the, well, quite a lot of the work that's been done on, you know, the new value divide and um, and I think tells a pretty consistent story uh, with what we've seen in, in, other, um, in other Western democracies. The social grades self-reported as uh, individuals were, um, were asked to uh, um, select their, uh, their social grade. Um, the pictures, um, yes, we've just started a project with psychologists at Kent. Um, there's something very interesting, I'm getting quite interested in this uh, self-affirmation theory, which is uh, basically, I think, has a lot to speak about this, which is um, the, the idea is that, look, why is nobody changing their mind, right, about Brexit? Well, in a way, that's confirmation bias, you know, you take the, um, you take the information that fits with your worldview and you disregard the information that doesn't fit with your worldview. And, you know, those early studies on uh, capital punishment in the 70s, um, would often, you know, we're, we're basically explaining what we're seeing now, which is if you give leavers a piece of information about economic costs, they are typically either disregarding that study or questioning its validity. Uh, if you give the same piece of information to Remainers, it's a full-blown justification for why they're right. But affirmation theory argues that if you want to connect with leavers or Remainers and challenge their views, then you need to affirm their values before you present them with 
contradictory information. And the classic example is if you're a smoker and I say to you, uh, well, you know, smoking is uh, increasing your chances of lung cancer, you probably, you know, disregard it. Well, there's some experiments now showing that if you ask smokers to participate in an exercise that reaffirms their identity and their values and makes them feel a little bit better of themselves, about themselves, they're more open to actually considering and discussing uh, information that compromises their values, right? This might be a straw in the wind, um, but I think it's an interesting literature that suggests that people are at least open to a conversation. Uh, now, of course, there's a whole other strand of literature that would suggest once our values are set in stone, then there's nothing that's going to change them uh, in, in, in a meaningful way. So I think this is up for, this is going to be, you know, a fight to the end uh, between leavers and remainers. And it may be that generational change ends up being quite significant, but, um, but we're going to have to come back and have a seminar in 25 years to, uh, to answer that one. Um, the uh, issue of um, the, uh, uh, yeah, the responsibility the responsibility of the left and the last ditch attempts to make people um, uh, worry about their jobs and why Cameron punted on the referendum. Um, I think you, you don't need to walk far in Westminster to find somebody that will blame the Labour Party for Brexit. Um, Jeremy Corbyn, I suspect, voted for leave, my personal view. I suspect it comes out of a traditional tradition within the Labour Party of Euroscepticism that's always viewed the European Union as a capitalist club. And despite Corbyn's best efforts, he was unable to inspire uh, large chunks of uh, Labour voters. I mean, overall, within the, Labour, within the 2017 Labour electorate, right, in, in June, of those voters who voted for Labour, about 64% voted Remain. So still, you know, one in three uh, went from voting for leave to back to um, voting for Labour uh, in June. And, you know, we shouldn't really be surprised by that, given that we know that lots of voters on the left are socially conservative on identity issues. And, but I think, you know, I my, my instinct, we'll never know, is that they could never really have been persuaded otherwise unless the Labour Party was willing to talk to them on the identity issues that they felt especially anxious about. Alan Johnson was given space to talk to the Labour electorate, but was given no money, no funding, no support to actually speak to Labour voters. So the only spokespeople they had, firstly, had very little resource. But the second issue is that most Labour politicians, even today, most Social Democrats more generally in Europe today, are struggling to come to terms with the values divide that lots of other academic work has shown is running across European democracies. And I think that social democracy has a really big challenge on its hands in trying to really get to grips with that. And the Labour Party at the referendum was the first real example of, uh, I think, a social democrat, you know, if you still think Labour is social democracy, but a, a social democrat party trying to, or, or at least feeling the full force of how that backlash can manifest. And uh, let's not forget a lot of those Labour voters have also now defected to the Conservative Party. So if you look at pro-Brexit Labour areas in the UK, so Labour held seats that voted in a majority for Brexit, in those seats in June, the Conservative vote share on average increased by 12, 12 points. Uh, across the UK on average, the Conservative vote share increased by about five. So there's no doubt that the Labour Party, even though it had a better than expected election, is under pressure within that pro-Brexit territory from the Conservatives who have been speaking more to the working class on migration and Brexit. Now, of course, historically, many of those seats are also laf uh, safe Labour seats, so they don't currently need to really worry too much. But the Conservative vote share did go up quite dramatically in some of those more declining manufacturing areas where voters have been struggling, and I think that's worth um, worth remembering. Um, I, I'll leave it there because I'm anxious only of letting the discussants have yeah. the last minute. So, do you have any more questions before we hand it back to the discussants? Uh, yeah. uh, Tom Zavish, uh, I'm a Max Weber Fellow at the Economics Faculty. The um, consensus in economics increasingly is that there may well be very significant local effects of immigration economically 
on lower educated, lower skilled individuals. And 72% of Labour voters uh, voted because, as you said, of immigration as a primary cause. And th there seems to be a separation between what you call identity reasons. I'd just like to explore a bit more in what sense immigration would have been a pragmatic economic reason. Based on what you've shown, it doesn't seem to me like you can explain it in self-interest terms. It doesn't seem to me like there are enough low-skilled individuals adversely affected by immigration to explain the Brexit vote. But I wonder to what extent notions of fairness, perhaps from other voters, may have actually been the cause of voting leave. So the sort of narrative might be there's a perceived injustice that arises due to immigration, which is linked to the EU membership, but you vote, and it affects a small fraction of the, of, the, of the population, but you vote because of that perceived injustice. So it's not just a national identity issue. Immigration here is a, an economic issue, but you, you might not vote for it because it's a self-interest question, it's a wider question. Thank you. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, this is not to sound like a, a, a broken record, but um, this, this is why I like the, uh, the work on nostalgic deprivation, because it makes that specific point. There's, it's still, I think, I mean, it's fair to say that that, that that work now is, even though it comes from a long tradition, how relative deprivation applies to contemporary political behavior is, is just beginning to pick up traction uh, and I suspect there'll be a lot more work to come but they, it makes that specific point that sociotropic concerns about the group and a feeling of injustice around how that group has um, been uh, sort of treated uh, economically but also so uh, socially uh, politically and and the literature is very clear in saying a sense of political loss no longer represented in in the corridors of power you know lack of blue-collar MPs and Oliver Heath has written about this in the UK, Jeff Evans as well, the decline of um, descriptive representation for many of the voters that went on to vote for Brexit, a process that began in the 90s, perhaps feeling or entrenching a view that the political system more generally is just no longer actually representing those groups. And in the, in the US now too, the sort of emerging debate about you know, we know the educational divide. We've, you know, we've 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 had decades of work on on that divide within the electorate, but now also the educational divide as it applies to representation. Um, looking at diploma democracy and uh, white collar government and those types of books over the last two years, I think have been quite interesting at entrenching that notion that, you know, while the while from below the grassroots, we've had these new divisions opening up and putting certain social groups on in different different positions on these issues. On the supply side, political systems themselves have obviously been changing quite dramatically and not necessarily doing so in a way that speaks to that feeling of injustice and marginalization. Um, I, I certainly have a lot of time for that. But also, just my last point, the literature as well on cultural threat as well as, you know, and how that relates to to perceptions of migration. So if you'd looked at Laura McLaren's work from 2002 onwards, you would have, I think, reached the conclusion that unless the Remain camp spoke to identity threat as people saw that, they were always going to be the underdog, yeah? That her argument consistently in terms of British public attitudes, but we've seen Paul Snyderman make the same argument and Marcel Lubers and others that that cultural sense of loss and threat is as important, if not more important, than economic uh, threat. And I, you know, it's it's contested, and we're all going to debate it for many years to come, I'm sure. But if you did accept that argument, then your conclusion would have been that David Cameron and the Remain camp have to somehow um, speak to people's worries over a broader set of loss as that relates to values ways of life and national community, that it wasn't enough just to talk about economic self-interest and individual jobs and household income. If you go back and you look at those George Osborne speeches now, 
and they are remarkable in their relentless focus on individual economic self-interest, right? Which completely sort of was at odds with, with that strand of literature saying it's sociotropic, it's cultural. It was wrapped up in feelings and worries about community as well as assessments of whether Europe was working for, uh, for or against Britain. So I, I have a lot of sympathy for your point. Um, so I was now going to offer the commentators a chance if they wanted to add anything else to the discussion. Sophia? Um, thanks a lot. Um, I found this discussion very helpful, especially um, when it came to your um, perspective of what is going to happen now in, in Great Britain and the p potential planks for populist parties. Um, I'm excited to see if this is actually happening. Thanks a lot. Contentious. I, 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 have <laughs> to, I have to say the most bizarre uh, thing you said, and which yeah. I also read in the book, yeah. is that immigration is a balance issue. <laughs> if ever there was a position issue, it's immigration. Now, your argument... <laughs> Your argument is 75% of the British are against immigration, <clears throat> even if 75% of the British are against immigration. It's still a position issue, 75% take one position. But, I mean, the question your 75% uh, are based on is Britain should take back control over immigration. And that is, of course, something very different. Because people don't uh, uh, appreciate the way Europe has dealt with the refugees and messed up uh, uh, the, the, the immigration in that way. But, I mean, one thing, you, I, I appreciate everything you said about the cultural threat and, and the link of immigration to cultural, not simply, or not even primarily, economic threat. Immigration, European integration, and all that is linked to cultural liberalism is a bundle of cultural issues which is structuring party space across Europe, even in the United States that Trump has been given as an example, and even in Britain. Mm -hmm. So, the, I mean, we, in our analysis, we find very clearly there is the second dimension. Cultural liberalism is represented by the Lib Dems, and UKIP is down under with uh, anti-immigration. Mm -hmm. So you, you find uh, left-right, Labour Conservatives, and Lib Dem, UKIP, I mean, I, I sketch a little bit sketchily, but that's the basic story. I mean, the basic story is that I would say it's all about cultural identity, about nationalism. Galtan said the, one, the, uh, the others, and we say it's about demarcation, integration, others say it's about cosmopolitan, the cosmopolitan cleavage, mm. others say it's universalism, particularism. Mm. That, I mean, this story should be told and, and not balance issue. I, I mean, I'm always struck by the fact that British authors, as I thought it was your co-authors who wrote that, that immigration is a balance issue. It's, it's a British uh, pastime to, to think everything is a balance issue and Downs was wrong and position issues are very rare. But, but two other comments. Uh, you reaffirm what you said in your talk and what I uh, try to undermine. You say some voted for Brexit because of this, some for that, so some because of feelings, <laughs> others because they uh, saw cost and benefits. I think it's a syndrome. If you have this British identity, if you are defending British nationalism, sovereignty, you also think the EU is, is emotionally uh, something very negative, and you also think uh, it's not risky to get out, and you also think the benefits are there if you get out. And the third thing I would uh, like to comment on, I am with you that we should disentangle direct and indirect effects. I only think one should do it correctly and one should do it, interpret the results adequately. 
And one way to do it would be a structural equation model. Another way to do it would be longitudinal designs. Now, you have written that you had three surveys, but one was in May before the campaign, and the other one was just a week. The second one was a week before the third one, and you only used the second and the third one. I think. I don't know what's in the first one, but I think to answer the questions about cues and about the impact of the campaign and of Boris Johnson and, and, and these things, you need to have a panel design where you have the measure in May compared to the measure after the elections in June. And I don't know whether you can do it, but that would be a possibility. Um, so just a few comments that have come up since since the questions, just, just thinking about them. I think one of the best comments um, was from Julia, which was about the PR, the transition to PR in 1999 in European elections. The reason, there's two reasons why this is such a good comment. One, it's at the correct level of analysis, i.e. the aggregate level. It was the UK which left the EU, and it was the UK which transitioned to the PR system. However, that explains the rise of UKIP. What explains Brexit far better, also at the aggregate level, so away from all these individual level debates, which I don't think can explain Brexit anyway, what really matters is not just the transition to PR at the European level, but the combination of that with first past the post at the domestic level. This means two things. One, it means UKIP could get lots of money from Brussels. The other thing at, in the, at the European level, the other, and exposure and everything else. The other thing is that at the domestic level, it meant that the governing parties had to take on, or particularly the Conservatives, had to take on board UKIP's policies. It wasn't like in Germany where there's, or elsewhere where there's a PR system they could build a coalition without UKIP. They had to bring some of the UKIP policies into the first past the post tense because if, if the right gets divided in a PR system, it doesn't matter so much, but in a majoritarian system, it's critical. They, every vote to UKIP increases the chance of a Labour government, not... Uh, a conservative, not just a conservative loss. So that's absolutely, I think, crucial, that, that, that wicked combination when it comes to EU membership. The other thing was about risk aversion from Kiki, and I think this is also a great point, because it's true that we all thought, including myself, that Remain would win because of status quo bias. People would go with the status quo, and they didn't. But it's not that status quo bias didn't matter. It mattered for, that was the main reason for 50% of the Remain voters which shows you how Eurosceptic the UK was already. Despite status quo bias, the UK still voted to leave. So I think that's a great point as well. And then the other thing about Cameron, which this has been debated so much, and I think it's, again, looking at the wrong level of analysis, Cameron called the referendum because he had to. That was the only reason why. He would have never been re-elected for these reasons about first past the post, which I've already been discussed, if he hadn't called a referendum. And once he was re-elected, which took everyone, including him, by surprise as a, as a majority, he then had to, of course, deliver the referendum. And this is endogenous for a few reasons. One, all political actors, like media actors, all this party Q stuff, are endogenous to the national, to the unit of analysis here, which is the UK. And um, secondly, this, this whole Cameron stuff is supposed, forgets how Eurosceptic, genuinely, not for political reasons, but genuinely Eurosceptic, the Conservative Party was. Until he called the referendum in 2013 or so, 2014, every day they were barking at him to call the referendum. They made him promise more and more and more and more, and it was never enough. And the, the Conservative strategist said, call the referendum, shoot the UKIP fox. That was their very conservative uh, analogy. And... Um, Indeed, he eventually had to. He didn't think it would even matter because he didn't think he would win. But because Euroscepticism was so strong, he did win. So it even goes to show you there how Euroskeptic the UK is. I'm going to give a final word to Matthew, but I think maybe Britain would have left the EU by the time we respond to all of the comments that have been made. <laughs> so, uh, and, and we, of, of course, we already have very good value from Matthew. So, you know, final word, and uh, then we can conclude. Thank you. Sure. Um, well, can I just thank everybody for their comments uh, and um, some really excellent feedback. Um, 
I'm in one of those for well, fortunate or unfortunate positions, however you see it, to be able to say, well, it's published anyway. So uh, there you go. <laughs> you can you can uh, you can slate the book in a review article, um, and I look forward to it. But the the issue of um, just a quick couple of points. The the issue, firstly, James, you made me think about status quo bias, and one of the blogs that was bizarrely on point ahead of the referendum was by Stephen Fisher and Alan Renwick, and nobody really read it at the time, but they, they examined 228 referendums around the world, and they examined the Larry LeDuc thesis that voters would go back to the status quo as the polling day approached. And they found that in 69% of cases, um, voters actually backed the change option uh, when most of where various thresholds had been reached. And it's a very interesting blog to go back now, having gone through the Brexit referendum, and look at actually a, that piece of evidence, because it certainly undermined Cameron's view. Cameron bought into that heavily. He really genuinely believed that people would come back to the status quo, largely because his strategists were telling him that. They decided that they would only focus on in a nutshell, they'd segmented the British electorate into six groups, and they'd kind of decided that the cosmopolitan liberals were definitely going to vote Remain, and the anti-immigration uh, kind of um, communitarians were definitely going to vote for Brexit. But there were two groups in the middle that would be swayed on economic arguments. And that was the strategy, effectively, for the Remain camp. Um, but of course, we know that, in hindsight, that was not enough. And I've suggested a couple of reasons as to why that wasn't enough, but uh, but I appreciate others will have their own views. On the, pop, the, the valence and position debate, I understand that, I accept that. It's, you know, I, you know I'm, um, I just take a different, I just take a very different view of immigration within the British context in that I, I genuinely do not feel it is as contested as the position approach would have us believe, but I'm willing to um, say that you know we will agree to disagree. Um, and it may be that if if you apply you know the cultural liberal anti-immigration two-dimension approach to brexit, I'd be keen to see it and I'd be keen to actually um, you know uh, have a debate about it um, because I think you know there's a lot more to do. Um, and uh, I just wanted to thank you again for your comments and for um, coming along to what has undoubtedly been the most intellectually stimulating uh, event that I've been uh, to for um, a long time. So my uh, view of the EUI has only uh, uh, improved even uh, further. So thank you very much for your uh, feedback.